Yeah, I just, when did he start learning about the situation in India? Because he wasn't raised with that in England. Uh, not officially, but he actually joined a, a secret society when he was at Cambridge uh, and started to get to know the situation from there. I didn't have time to go into all the details of his life, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, so now, on April 30th, 1901, Aurobindo married this lady. Uh, really, it's one thing to read it online, it's another thing to actually try and say it out loud. Um, Rinalini Bose. M-R-I-N-A-L-I-N-I. -I -I. How would you pronounce that? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, she was the eldest daughter of a, uh, I think a prominent lawyer, Bhupal Chandra Bose in Calcutta. I may be only printed out one. Yeah. There it is. Uh, in 1901, Aurobindo attended a few seances instigated by his younger brother, Barindra. The external results, including a mediumistic contact with Swami, Swami Ramakrishna, were of little value in themselves. However, they showed Aurobindo the limitations of the view that physical reality is the only reality. He learned of the existence of supraphysical agencies and planes of consciousness and the possibility of attaining them. During the same year, Aurobindo narrowly averted an accident in his carriage near Baroda. In the seconds before the accident, he found that, quote, with the will to prevent it, there appeared a being of light in him, who was, as it were, the master of the situation and able to control the details. This experience provided the raw material for his sonnet called The Godhead. Yeah, let me see who we got. Yes. Peter, Peter Manier, how about you? I'll switch screen here just a second. I'll have to scroll as we go. The The Godhead, I stand behind the dance of danger's hooves. In the shouting street that seemed a futurist whim and suddenly felt exceeding nature's grooves in me, enveloping me, the body of him. Above my head, a mighty head was seen, a face with the calm of immortality, an omnipotent gaze that held the scene in the vast circle of its sovereignty. His hair was mingled with the sun and breeze. The world was in his heart and he was I. I housed in me the everlasting peace, the strength of one whose substance cannot die. The moment passed and all was as before, only that deathless memory I bore. Sri Aurobindo collected poems. Hmm. Because poetry played such a large role in his life, I thought it was important that you get a taste for some of the early poetry that he was doing. I guess he was in his very early 30s at this point. He gained another glimpse of supra-rational force when in two separate incidences, the intervention of the power of prayer was clearly responsible for the avoidance of the death of a relative and a friend. And then in April 1903, during a trip to Kashmir in the north of India, Aurobindo visited the hill of Shankaracharan to see the seat of Solomon. In his poem entitled Adwaita, he reveals the profound nature of the experience of the vacant infinite he enjoyed on that remote pinnacle. Okay, how about Jack? Number 12. I walked 
on the highwayed seat of Solomon, where Shankaracharya's tiny temple stands, facing infinity from time's edge, alone on the bare ridge ending Earth's vain romance. Around me was a formless solitude. All had become one strange, unnameable. An unborn soul reality, world nude, topless and fathomless, forever still. A silence that was being's only word, the unknown beginning and the voiceless end, abolishing all things moment seen or heard on an incommunicable summit reigned, a lonely calm and void unchanging peace on the dumb crest of nature's mysteries. Hmm. So the cumulative effect of these spiritual experiences was potent enough to convince Aurobindo to investigate the spiritual realms further. At this time in 1904, 11 years after his return to India, he was a professor of English and French, as well as the principal of Baroda College. These activities were gradually relegated to a secondary position by his all-consuming interest in the struggle for Indian independence from the imperial grasp of England. His passionate eloquence and unswerving, accurate, unswervingly accurate political judgment had quickly earned him the undisputed leadership of the nationalist movement in Bengal. At this stage, his interest in yoga was still subordinate to his political activity. Now, during the year 1904, Aurobindo began yoga somewhat seriously. Its chief attraction for him lay in its potential for heightening the power and clarity of vision which he brought to the political arena. Okay, let's see here. How about Joey now? Number 13. Okay. I did not know what God was. It was two years before I met Lele that I began yoga seriously. Deshpand at that time was doing Hatha yoga, asanas and other practices as he had a great proselytizing tendency. He wanted to convert me to his view, but I thought that a yoga which requires me to give up the world was not for me. I had to liberate my country. I took it up seriously when I learned that the same pasha, papasha, which one does not get away from the world can be turned into action. I learned that yoga gives me power and I thought, why should I not get power and use it to liberate my country? So that word I think is tapasya. Tapasya? Yeah, and it's a it's a special one in his vocabulary. So I thought I would have uh, we better have it mentioned here. Bill, if you wouldn't mind reading this out here, this is from the glossary in this particular book. Not sure he heard you, dear. Oh, Bill, are you there? There he is. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, which one am I reading? Sorry, Linda, Mastery is phoning. I guess they're having trouble getting in. Do you want to pick up the phone? Sorry. Okay, Bill, yeah, we're on number 14 here. 14. Yeah. <clears throat> Tapasia, effort, energy, austerity of the personal will, concentration of the will and energy to control the mind, vital and physical, and to change them or to bring them down the higher consciousness or for any other lodge 
any other yog yogic or high purpose? That's yogic. Yeah. So from yoga. Uh, so the idea here is that it's a it's a form of uh, energy that's generated. So here it is. In the previous one, I took it up seriously when I learned that the same tapasya which one does to get away from the world can be turned to action. This is a crucial insight for him. So he, he had very specific urges that directed him into yoga. He wanted to um, be an even better politician at that point in order to be able to affect and change in the status of the Indian people vis-a-vis -vis the British. Now, oh, let me just uh, stop sharing and then come back here. So I have a question on, on that. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like here we have an example of someone who is saying, I'm going to take spiritual power and use it in the material world to accomplish uh, uh, mat relatively material goals yep. and pursuing that as a, as a path, as a choice. Is that uh, something that we see a lot of? And, and, and if we have examples of that, what are the typical outcomes of this kind of choice? Well, uh, you see that a lot in the West where people take up yoga in order to be able to relax, to be more supple, you know, to keep their balance as they get older. Uh, they, they learn meditation in order to have calmness, mindfulness. Um, it's a little more rare, at least in the West, for politicians to take it up in order to be able to be better politicians. You could kind of hope that they would do that, but uh, I suppose it did happen in India quite frequently. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, I guess, was doing forms of yoga all the way through his life. Um, and you saw the results in his, his dealings with the public. Um, now, this is just Aurobindo's starting point, though. His, his uh, reasons for doing it quickly changed when he realized the limitations of being able to do things uh, politically, uh, as you'll see as we go on tonight. So this is, I guess, his way into that particular style of life, which was to open up worlds to him that he had no idea were there, which he ended up exploring, which he felt could have a direct influence on our physical lives, which was unusual for a yogi. So Mark, from what you're saying and what you're telling us, teaching us here, he had one of the characteristic signs of these great spiritual personalities, which was a transformation. The transformation, England was preparation, gave him the linguistic skills for what followed. But the way I'm reading the information you're giving us, one, once he, he landed in India, he was impregnated with the spiritual atmosphere of the country. Uh, something very radical happened to him there. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. It took a while, but uh, uh, particularly next week, we'll see some of the experiences that he, he talks about that led to him really just this divorcing himself from, from the, uh, the realm of wor the world around him and isolating himself in Southern India. Yeah, and Bill's, uh, as for Bill's comment, yeah, I, I wondered the same thing, Bill, as you did. You know, the spiritual man usually doesn't choose the political path, although there's lots of exceptions to that, uh, Joan of Arc and so on and so forth. but. It was an early attempt at finding his way, right? Like he felt at that point, Mark, his spiritual energies 
should be directed toward the cause of liberating India. But from what you're telling us, he soon discovered that was not the path that God intended him to be on. Is that right? Yeah. But he, he almost single-handedly launched the, uh, the effective nationalist movement in India and then stepped away from it. Only of three years later, I think it was. Even before Gandhi then, right? Yep. that's right. Hmm. So I wanted to show you this, uh, why is this? Huh. All my icons are standing in a way of what I want to, there it is, okay. This charming lady is Mira Alfasa, still living in Paris. She's 24 at this point. <clears throat> and she has her first vision of Sri Aurobindo in a dream. So she thought it was somebody called Krishna, interestingly enough. And she had many dreams of him. Uh, anyway, one wonders if this was related in some way to Aurobindo starting to take his first steps in yoga over in India. I just leave that with you. I'm not sure that that's true or not. But. Okay, now. So I guess uh, Ingrid's online, right? Oh, yep, I'm here, Mark. Yep. Okay, could you read 15? the 15? Yes, please. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry, there's one little paragraph I have to read first. <clears throat> so it was with this inner guidance. Inner guidance. What's happening? Is, are you hearing me twice? David, David uh, just joined us. David, could you mute yourself, please? That's, sure. Thank that's you. Weird. Okay. Get an echo there. Okay, so Orbindo had that intuition that he could be a better politician, if you like, a more effective spokesperson if he was to adopt yogic practice. So he had that inner guidance that started him in his yoga in 1904. He consulted with a particular disciple of Swami Brahmananda as to the details of the practice of uh, the yoga of breath, pranayama. He continued to the practice on his own for four years, whenever his hectic schedule permitted, after which time it was terminated. As he noted many years later, uh, in 1932, the results had been appreciable. He had gained, and number 15 now is for Ingrid, increased health and outflow of energy, some psychophysical phenomena, a great outflow of poetic creation, and a limited power of subtle sight, luminous patterns and figures, etc., mostly with the waking eye. So in an evening talk with his disciples on September 19th, 1926, Aurobindo was asked what part pranayama plays in bringing about higher consciousness. I found his uh, answer quite illuminating. Uh, how about Heather? I see you're with us. So let's do number 16. You have to unmute yourself, Heather. I'm oh, sorry. There you are. It sets the pranic vital currents free and removes dullness of the brain so that the higher consciousness can come down. Pranayama does not bring dullness in the brain. My own experience, on the contrary, is that the brain becomes illumined. When I was practicing pranayama at uh, Baroda, I used to do it for about five hours in the day, three hours in the morning and two in the evening. I found that the mind began to work with great illumination and power. I used to write poetry in those days. Before the Prarayama practice, I usually I wrote five to eight lines per day and about 200 lines in a month. After the practice, I could write 200 lines within half an hour. That was not the only result. 
Formerly, my memory was dull. But after this practice, I found that when the inspiration came, I could remember all the lines in their order and write them down correctly at any time. Along with these advanced functionings, I could see an electrical activity all around the brain, and I could feel that it was made of a subtle substance. I could feel everything as the working of that substance. Evening Talks with Sia Aurobinda, recorded by A.B. Parani. Hmm. I find that uh, intensification of his ability to write poetry really staggering. To be able to go from 200 lines in a month to 200 in a half an hour is uh, exceptional to say the least. And his memory developing like that. I, I should really take this practice up, obviously. If maybe it would save me from Alzheimer's. I don't know. But anyway, so this wasn't his main form of practice later in life, but at this key point in his life, it really played a major part. These well, Mark, phenomena must have exerted quite an influence on his mind if the following piece of evidence is any indication. In, the high, in a highly revealing letter to his wife, dated August 30th, 1905, Aurobindo outlines the extent to which he has become, he has been overcome by spiritual concerns. He tells her he has been affected by three madnesses. Uh, how about Lori? You get okay. to do the first two. So that's reading number 17. Correct. I have three madnesses. The first one is this. I firmly believe that the accomplishments, genius, higher education, and learning and wealth that God has given me are his. I have a right to, to spend for my own purposes only what is needed for the maintenance of the family and is otherwise absolutely essential. The rest must be returned to God. My second madness has only recently seized me. It is this, by whatever means I must have the direct vision of God. Religion these days means repeating the name of God at any odd hour, praying in public, showing off how pious one is. I want nothing of this. If God exists, there must be some way to experience his existence to meet him face to face. However arduous this path is, I have made up my mind to follow it. By the way, the wealth he's talking about is not uh, money. He was you know, barely surviving financially. So that wasn't the type of wealth he was discussing. <clears throat> um, Alan, would you read uh, Number 18, then, to finish off the third madness? Sure. <clears throat> the third madness is that while others look upon their country as an inert piece of matter, a few meadows and fields, forests and hills and rivers, I look upon my country as the mother. I adore her. I worship her as the mother. What would a son do if a demon sat on his mother's breast and started sucking her blood? Would he quietly sit down to his dinner, amuse himself with his wife and children, or would he rush out to defend his mother? I know I have the strength to deliver this fallen race. It is not physical strength. I'm not going to fight with sword or gun but the strength of knowledge. This feeling is not new to me. It is not of today. I was born with it. It is my, in my very marrow. God sent me to earth to accomplish this great mission. Hmm. Well, this was in 1905. He was 33 years old at that point. 
are still heavily involved in politics. <clears throat> so it's obvious from the contents of this lengthy letter that the divine is playing a more significant role in Aurobindo's life than it had done previously. His earlier chief concern, that of freeing India from her oppressors, has now been placed third among his madnesses. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that it has been reduced to tertiary interest since these madnesses are not ranked in order of importance, but it does indicate a tendency towards the equalization of divine and temporal affairs in his head. While he was on a visit to Swami Ramananda in Chandad in June 1906, Aurobindo went to a temple of the goddess Kali on the banks of the Narmada River. To this point in his life, many of the ancient verities of Hinduism lacked the power to arouse his spirit because they took the form of graven images to which he was averse. On this occasion, however, he was to encounter the truth underlying ritual worship face to face. Okie dokie. Well, I guess we're up to uh, Belinda, the number 19. There you go. Okay. Yes, please. Or you stand before a temple of Cali beside a sacred river and see what? A sculpture, a gracious piece of architecture, but in a moment mysteriously, unexpectedly, there is instead a presence, a power, a face that looks into yours, an inner sight in you has regarded the world mother. Hmm. Yeah. So he would later document this experience in a poem he called The Stone Goddess. And I would ask David to read this one since he's a poet himself. Sorry, David, could you unmute yourself? I muted you too quickly. Okay. Sorry, David, thanks. The Stone Goddess. In a town of gods housed in a little shrine, from sculptured limbs the Godhead looked at me. A living presence, deathless and divine, a form that harbored all infinity. The great world mother and her mighty will inhabited the earth's abysmal sleep. Voiceless, omnipotent, inscrutable, mute in the desert, in the sky and deep. Now veiled with mind, she dwells and speaks no word voiceless, inscrutable, omniscient, hiding until our soul has seen, has heard the secret of her strange embodiment. One in the worshiper and the immobile shape, at beauty and mystery, flesh or stone and drape. And his collected poems. So the importance of this event lies not only in its removal of Aurobindo's veil of abhorrence of image worship, thus allowing a more profound understanding of Hinduism without an intellectual barrier. It is also a major step towards his later fundamental conviction that everything, including all forms of matter are divine and therefore must not be rejected as unworthy of spiritual attention. Okay, so now we come to the, probably one of the most important events of his life in terms of yoga. I'm gonna to have to stop this for a second and then come back here. This scary looking guy is Vishnu Bhaskar Lili. Now, let me come back to the readings. In December 1908, Aurobindo expressed his wish for spiritual guidance. 
It was arranged for him to meet with a Maharashtran yogi by the name of Vishnu Bhaskar Lili. Upon Lili's request, Aurobindo suspended all his political activities for three days and retired to a private room with the yogi. There was given the following instruction. Uh, how about Suzanne? Number 21. Number 21, okay. Sit down, I was told. Look and you will see that your thoughts come into you from outside before they enter. Fling them back, fling them back. I sat down and looked and saw to my astonishment that it was so. I saw and felt concretely the thought approaching as if to enter through or above the head and was able to push it back concretely before it came inside. Letters on himself and the ashram. Hmm. Hmm. So Aurobindo was surprised to find himself able to comply with Lele's instructions as quickly as he did. By the end of the first day, he had mastered the technique. By the end of the third day, the silence was fir so firmly embedded in his consciousness that it remained a permanent feature of his mind for the remainder of his life. Uh, Margaret, would you read uh, 22 for us, please? From that moment in principle, the mental being in me became a free intelligence a universal mind, not limited to the narrow circle of personal thought as a laborer in a thought factory, but a receiver of knowledge from all the hundred realms of being and free to choose what it willed in this vast sight empire and thought empire. I mention this only to emphasize that the possibilities of the mental being are not limited and it can be the free witness and master in its own house. It is not to say that everybody can do it in the way I did it, with the same rapidity of the decisive moment, but a progressive freedom and mastery of one's mind is perfectly within the possibilities of anyone who has the faith and the will to undertake it. So this was a central experience and so he has a, a later description of this same experience that uh, is also relevant so let me see here what we got how about Gila number 23 is the one we're on okay I myself had my experience of nirvana and silence in the Brahman, etc., long before there was any knowledge of the overhead spiritual planes. Sorry. It can first simply by an absolute stillness and blotting out as it were for all mental, emotional, and other inner activities. The body continued indeed to see, walk, uh, speak and do its other business, but as an empty automatic machine and nothing more. I did not become aware of any pure I, nor even of any self, impersonal or other. There was only an awareness of that uh, as the sole reality, all else being quite unsubstantial. Unsust uh, unsubstantial, void, non-real, as to what realized that reality. It was a nameless consciousness, which was not other than that. Neither was I aware of any lower soul or outer self called by such and such a personal name that was performing the feat of arriving at the consciousness of Nirvana. You have to realize that this experience that he's had uh, very early in his life is the one that forms the goal of most of Hinduism and Buddhism. All these 
people spend decades and decades of their lives striving for this experience. And here he is as a young man having it given to him almost. Lily was completely flabbergasted that he was able to do this in such short order and so completely. The spiritual experience of utter silence that began with Lily at Baroda became more intense during a visit to Bombay. Here the vacant condition of his mind turned into the experience of the silent Brahman consciousness. In the midst of the busy movement of Bombay, Aurobindo looked at the world around him as a picture in a cinema show, all unreal and shadowy. He was to retain this poise of mind, as he called it, for the rest of his life. Now, not surprisingly, he wrote another poem about it, which he called Nirvana. Now, I think we have to go back to the beginning, or the, yeah, the start of our list. We've done other people. Okay, Kim. We turn back to you, number 24. Nirvana. All is abolished, but the mute alone. The mind from thought released, the heart from grief, growing existent, now beyond belief. There is no I, no nature, known unknown. The city, a shadow picture without tone, floats, quivers, unreal. Forms without relief flow, a cinema's vacant shapes, like a reef foundering in shoreless gulfs, the world is done. Only the illimitable permanent is here, a peace stupendous, featureless, still replaces all. What once was I, in it, a silent, unnamed emptiness, content either to fade in the unknowable or thrill with the luminous seas of the infinite. So obviously we could read these more than once before we come to an understanding of what he's saying. A week or two after this experience, Aurobindo was invited by the Bombay National Union to address a meeting on July or January 19th, 1908. With his mind still calm and blank, he didn't know how he could deliver a speech. Lili encouraged him to go ahead, saying that he and some others would pray for him and that some voice would speak through him. Okay, let's see now. Eva, we're back to you for this. This is a short one, number 25. <clears throat> you unmute, unmute yourself, Eva. On the way to the meeting, someone gave me a paper to read. When I rose to speak, the impression of the headline flashed across my mind, and then all of the sudden, something spoke out. From this, Aurobindo understood the dynamic force hidden within yoga. From this point forward, he relied on this force as he conducted his whirlwind of political affairs. His ideal of divine life resulting from the complete transformation of human nature was derived from solid experience gained in the midst of a stormy political activity. So let's see what he looked like at this point. All right, let's go to this last. Okay, here he is at the age of 35 in Calcutta. <clears throat> As this description indicates, at the age of 35, Aurobindo had attained the highest state of consciousness accessible to a dedicated yogi, at least in the opinion of the majority of Hindu and Buddhist mystics. This was known as Nirvi Kalpa Samadhi to Hindus and Nirvana to Buddhists. Aurobindo had now been introduced to Brahman without qualities. Nirguna Brahman, it's called. The one behind the many. 
the essence in all created forms, the canvas on which is painted the phenomenal world. Both space and time were perceived as constructions of our senses with no underlying or no everlasting unchanging reality. Only Brahman is real. This seminal experience radically altered Aurobindo. From this time on, he began to think from above the brain, as he put it. His schoolboy rationalism had been transcended by spiritual perception. To his surprise, he also found that he no longer had to prepare his speeches beforehand as these would arise spontaneously from the new silent Brahman consciousness. All his subsequent writings were the product of the same supra-intellectual process. Yet another feature resulting from this nirvanic experience was the presence of an inner voice or guide, which would make important decisions for him, open valuable insights and act as his spiritual guide. By February 1908, it had become obvious to Lili that Aurobindo, possessing this inner voice and adhering steadfastly to its injunctions, was no longer in need of a human guru. His role in Aurobindo's life had come to an end. In his looks famous... Like, oh, sorry. Martha, sorry. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, please. Oh, looks like he's dropped the British dress at this point. Yes, he has. He's going native. <laughs> so in his famous Uttar Para speech on May 30th, 1909, concerning his trial for revolutionary activities, Aurobindo described the guidance he received from his voice from within for the first time to the public. Okay, let's see. Linda Russell is the next person. Number 26. Let me just stop this and go in here. There we go. I knew all along what he meant for me, for I heard it again and again. Always I listened to the voice within. I am guiding, therefore fear not. Turn to your own work for which I have brought you to jail, and when you come out, remember never to fear, never to hesita hesitate. Remember that it is I who am doing this, not you or any, nor any other. Therefore, whatever clouds may come, whatever dangers and sufferings, whatever difficulties, whatever impossibilities, there is nothing impossible nothing difficult. I am in the nation and its uprising, and I am Vasudeva. I am Narayana, and what I will shall be, not what others will. What I choose to bring about, no human power can sway. So I should say that Vasudeva and Narayana are alternate names for Krishna in Hinduism. So obviously, Aurobindo was no longer a man alone. He had attained the calm and silence of the higher mind, which is the next level above human intelligence. And he now felt himself to be an instrument in the hands of the divine. The contents of a letter he wrote to his, to his wife a year earlier were now even more clearly apparent. So this is the same one that he talked to the three madnesses. Okay, Harold, you get to say the last one for us. Oh, he may have had to leave. Did you leave already? No, you're there, Harold. You just, oh, okay. just need to unmute you, that's all. Okay, he had to leave at nine, so this is good timing. You're, you're still muted, Harold? Descend? Hmm. 
What's going on? I don't know what the problem is. It's too bad. You're not able to unmute. Can you hear us, Harold? Oh, there uh, you go. I think I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm very sorry. It took me a long time to make the buttons work. Okay, reading number 27. But there is only one thing that must be said now. And this is that from now on, I am no longer the master of my own will. Like a puppet, I must go wherever God takes me. Like a puppet, I must do whatever he makes me do. From now on, you will have to understand that all I do depends not on my will, but is done at the command of God. 1908. Mm -hmm. So he's come a long way from when he <clears throat> arrived in India in 1904. There was sorry, it wasn't 1904. What was the date? 1893. Okay, sorry, 15 years. At that time, he was a total agnostic. Now he's a complete believer in the divine, having had multiple experiences of his own. He's been converted. And that's where we're going to leave him for the week until we come around and finish off his life next time. So let's see what people have to say about all of that. Sorry for all the back and forthing with the, uh, <laughs> the screen sharing. Wow, that's awkward. I should be able to switch from one program to another, but I, I'm not able to do that. I'll fix that for next week. <clears throat> Mark? Yes. I'm just thinking he seems a very Western, or his his description of God, and presumably he's writing this in English. Is that correct? His writings yes, yes. are in English. And his statement of God sounds very much like a Western concept rather than a Hindu or even a Buddhist concept, which, which strikes me as being yeah. much more a detached or spiritual yeah. um, conception of the divine. Well, that may be partly based on the selection that I made. Uh, I tried to stay away from some of the language that he uses, which is more laden with Hindu terms. Okay. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I can see how you would say that, but I'm not sure that it's true. his is necessarily a, a British kind of view of God. No. As you I, don't know about, I don't know about British, but but whether it's sort of a globally more Christian rather than or or a monotheistic, almost maybe from the Islamic tradition in India, which he's not from. I don't think he's from the no, Hindu. No, he's not. Right. He's familiar with oh. it, but he, he is not a, yeah. a Muslim. Anyway, okay. Mark, can, yeah. can I comment? Yeah. Sorry, Harold. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lori had her hand up, then Jack. Sorry. And then okay. Harold. I'm to do this in order. Okay. Lori has a has a pink hand and you don't see it as easily. <laughs> okay. Flesh colored. Uh, Go ahead, if Lori. I, if I'm next, I would like to yield to Harold because he has to leave at nine. And oh, this is true. Yeah, so Harold, you go. Yeah, I just want to comment on what was said before. There's a figure called Ramanuja. Ramanuja is one, a great figure in uh, Indian history. Yep. And he's sort of a theist or, you know, it, it, He's, he emphasizes worship, and I find the theology, or or you could say metaphysics, of Ramanuja very compatible um, with, with, say, Islam. And in fact, Ramanuja and a guy who came after him named Ramananda, another Ramananda, um, were, were led to the Sikh movement. It's almost like the, the Sikh faith was an accident waiting to happen. There was a type of theism that came in, uh, and this is post-Islamic influence. I think Islamic influence started around 1000, the year 1000, okay? So uh, on the other hand, um, you can find almost anything uh, um, uh, in terms of Hindu worldviews from extreme monism mm -hmm. to a type of dualism that's even more extreme than Ramanuja. But Ramanuja was sort of like what we, what we would call a theist. And so we can worship God through Rama or Krishna or some other means, but it's very similar 
as I understand it, to a Western or Middle Eastern point of view. Anyway, I got to go. Thank you so much. I'll see you next week. Okay, take care of yourself. Okay, Lori. I just have a whole other interest. So as we're leaving him, about how old is he, Mark? Uh, at this stage that yeah. we left him? Yeah. He's, he's uh, 30, 36. And do they have children? No. I just find I, I just find it so interesting how to balance the two worlds so that you live in this world and yet you're looking at something else. He must have had a lot of a lot of energy for sure. I, I just find that really interesting. This is it's an aspect of him which is rather unique actually. Um, most of the, the so-called mystics in that tradition tended to just go off and, and yeah. focus on the spiritual side of things and just disregard what was happening in the world around them. Yeah. They're escapists, if you like. Yeah. Whereas he keeps his feet firmly planted on the ground the whole time. Very interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Linda, you had a list Jack, of- Jack you. and then uh, Belinda. Okay. And uh, then Sylvie. Sylvie too, okay. Well, I'd just like to say for any of us who might find this uh, a little bit unbelievable, just read the Seven Valleys. <laughs> <laughs> and you, know, you will see that in the Seven Valleys, Baha'u'llah talks about these states, these mystical states as being somewhat normal for a mystic. And we, we, you know, we read these things, you know, I'm trying to finish a book now on the Seven Valleys. And, you know, you read these things and you think, well, how could these people have done this? But they did. You know, I mean, if we compare it with ourselves, and I mean, I have had many mystical experiences in my lifetime, but I've never experienced this uh, total change of consciousness in the waking state that that uh, Sri Aurobindo is talking about. So I, I just want to say that these things are, for anybody who doubts or thinks he may be full of himself, I don't think that's the case. Um, although there is a side to mysticism that can lead to self-aggrandizement, there's no question about that. Mm -hmm. If one does not st strictly adhere to humility. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying that I find all of these things totally credible. Uh, the Nirvana experience, I was reading about nir the Nirvana experience recently, and that it's, it's similar to what Baha'u'llah talks about in, um, in the Seven Valleys as Fana, the death of self, the annihilation. It's the annihilation of the phenomenal personality. Hmm. So that your self-understanding as it is now, whether you define yourself as Bill, David, Belinda, Jack, Gila, whoever you are, that goes, it's gone. And then it's replaced with something else. Now, Lori brings up an important and interesting point. What happens in everyday waking consciousness after these seminal life transforming experiences occur? How does the daily mundane brushing your teeth, et cetera. How does all, how does, what state of mind is, um, is the individual in then? And so that's a very, very speculative question. But, you know, I, I'm just saying that we have such a long way to go in spiritual exploration. And I think, Mark, this is gonna prove to be one of the valuable contributions of your course is that 
it allows us to understand how far an individual can go on the spiritual path. Now, just imagine what life would be like. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice if you could control every thought that ever came into your head? And so Sri Aurobindo saying, yes, that's what he attained. He was able completely to manipulate that world at will. Not only that, but I think from the quotes that you provided, Mark, he was able to tap into a reservoir of great spiritual knowledge or ancient archetypes, I think. That's what, that's what he was doing as far as I'm reading it. But So it is quite remarkable. And I will just say that I'm, I'm glad there are souls in the world like Sri Aurobindo who've attained this. Now, I'm glad he got out of the political thing because Abdul Baha is very clear that for Baha'is, not talking here about Gandhi or anybody else, but for Baha'is, religion and politics, they don't mix. Yeah, sure, exactly. And there's a very good reason for that. That's, that is because if somebody who thinks they have spiritual power gets involved in a political cause, that can be a recipe for disaster. It can be a recipe for violence, mm -hmm. fanaticism, death and destruction. So anyway, I'm, I'm glad he, he, he went through that, but I'm glad he chose a different, I mean, he, he was probably still engaged in many other ways, Mark, as you're going to tell us, but I'm glad he didn't choose the the radical political path that, that included violence. So Mark Belinda was next, and then Sylvie, and then Bill. Hey. You're unmuted. Oh, okay. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, I'm going back to um, uh, a question that was already touched on. When he came back to India, um, he had spent his virtually his entire childhood in an English speaking country and learning a lot of other European languages. So he clearly had a gift for language. I'm curious about how did he communicate with the people around him when he returned to India? Mm -hmm. Did he speak English or did he suddenly acquire whatever local language there was when he got off that boat? Um, or did he use English or some other European language? Um, I'm just kind of curious about that because um, the whole thing about language is interesting. He was sent to England um, by his father with kind of an explicit determination to shed anything that was Indian or Hindu. Yeah. Um, and then he, yeah. you know, and I, I started thinking about um, children sent to residential schools where they were not allowed yeah. to use the language. And um, and he had some of that in his childhood too. So there's a, there's a whole circle of things going on here. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, what language did he use to communicate with when he got off that boat? Does anyone know? Well, I'm not certain. He probably was speaking English. Uh, I mean, it was not uncommon for people in India to have some facility with that language. Oh yes, but, they but he he very shortly after that engaged tutors so that he could learn uh, uh, Bengali, Gujarati, Hindi, and Sanskrit. Oh. Uh, there was another one or two languages that he eventually but, learned. So soon he could communicate with anybody around him in their own language. I mean, the guy was very impressive yeah. <laughs> linguistically. That, that, that's astounding just by itself. But um, I had another comment, but I can't remember what it was now. So just sit. It's okay. Thank you. But to, to come back to a point that Margaret raised, uh, one of the reasons for choosing Aurobindo is that he wrote almost all of his works in English. Uh, that was my other comment. Uh, they're very distinguished volumes, I have to say. Mm -hmm. uh, 36 volumes, many of them you know, over 500 pages long. So he had a tremendous output over his life. Diary of the pen. Okay, so was it Sylvie next and then Bill? Yes. 
Okay, Sylvie. Um, I was just wondering, uh, well, actually Harold confused me because he started talking about Ramanujan, yeah. which I'm not sure, was he talking about the Indian mathematician Ramanujan? No, no not with an N at the end, Ramanujan. Okay, Ramanujan. This, this fellow from the Middle Ages. Okay, because Ramanujan, the, the Indian mathematician, was a contemporary of Sri Aurobindo and went to um, sorry, Cambridge with him at the same time. Do you know anything about whether they knew each other or whether they were part of this secret society or? No idea. Do you know all. anything about that? Uh, I have to say, I've never really looked into Ramanujan's life. I'm not sure what his dates were when he was in Britain. Around the same time. Yeah. yeah. The, the, I don't the know end which of the 19th, beginning of the 20th. Hmm? Was he in Oxford or Cambridge or do you know? He was at Cambridge. Oh, he was? Yeah, yeah. That's why he was oh, at the yeah. same time. I was wondering if you knew whether he was part of this secret society along with Sri Aurobindo. Um, yeah, I, I it just. I, I think the and society, then I had another, I'm sorry? I think the society was called the Lotus and Dagger Society. So okay. maybe you could check into that and, and come sure. back with that information for me. That would be very useful. Okay. And then the second question I had for you with regards to Sri Aurobindo's poetry really makes me think of Rumi yeah. and whether you've made any kind of connection between Rumi's um, I guess spiritual development uh, and uh, and I guess Sri Aurobindo's, you know, I mean, the language they use is a little bit different, but in a way uh, you could say that Rumi also reached Nirvana in a different, obviously through a, a Muslim or an Islamic uh, language or terms, terminology. Mm -hmm. Do you see a, a connection between those two or a, a you know, I don't know. I just when it, the poetry just really made me think of Rumi. So I was wondering what you were thinking about that. Actually, I haven't spent much time thinking about that direct connection. Um, what I'm aiming for, as I mentioned in my email yesterday, was to uh, spend a session where we try and compare the Baha'i faith and its stages of the soul with Aurobindo's uh, levels of higher consciousness. And to my mind, Rumi is very connected to the Baha'i version. So that would be a good place to, to make that connection. I'll have to, I'll have to start giving that some thought because they were both very powerful poets. No question about mm -hmm. it. Um, I, I think Aurobindo has, has yet to be taken, uh, to be appreciated for who he actually ended up being as you'll okay. see next week um uh, is it bill next yes okay. yeah it's bill um yes yeah, so uh, uh, i apologize in advance for like bringing this into the mundanity of the contemporary um but when i think of what we just learned about uh uh this guy uh, arabando uh and Moses, I see like a parallel in terms of, you might say, a spiritually enlightened individuals uh, uh, applying that to liberate their people. Uh, and uh, what Jack said with regard to, to Baha'is eschewing politics and, and it you know, and generally with our recent experience in, in watching uh, purported, but I think somewhat a lot of the people are sincerely spiritual in their beliefs that are driving some of the violence that we see like, say insurrections in the States and things like that. There's a religious spiritual element to that. So what, I, what I'm wondering is what distinguishes uh, the successful application of spiritual uh, enlightenment uh, uh, in terms of being useful for the progress of humanity uh, that we have in the examples of Moses and this person here 
uh, from the total disasters and the total uh, wariness that we have of religion being involved in anything political because we see so much uh, suffering as a result of it. What, what is the distinguishing factor maybe other than sincerity of the leadership or, or you know? Uh, I think it has to do with the level of consciousness that the person involved has attained. Um, as you'll see by the end of this part of the course, Aurobindo has a very well developed uh, stage levels, uh, developmental consciousness of how people can proceed from where we are at the moment. And each of them, as you move from one to the next, incorporates um, a larger and larger worldview, uh, embraces more and more people, um, is, is, well, I don't really have the words for it. Sorry, you've taken me away from what I've been thinking about. But um, Ken Wilbur is very effective in dealing with this because he talks about um, each of the levels of consciousness having its own vantage point on the world that it's in, that it's perceiving around it, and that vantage point is biased according to the limitations of the level of consciousness it's at. And so it, it will evaluate everything that happens around it according to the rules of the game that it's playing. And so many of the politicians who say they're spiritual are actually working from um, an old world kind of morality, for instance. And it can go way back to biblical times in some cases with the evangelicals, where they take literal truth from the Bible. Um, so they, they haven't appreciated some of the advances that humanity has made in the area of the rational self, for instance. And so they treat people in a different way than they would if they had actually uh, developed their minds and run their, their lives according to what they understood of life. I don't know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being a bit vague here because it's a huge topic that you're raising. And in fact, it's, it's going to be the central point of our discussions of, about Ken Wilbur. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I would just say it has to do with the level of understanding that a, a human being has when they take up a cause like that. Um, they're imposing their current vantage point on everyone around them. And if it's not very evolved, their advice and their orders are, are not going to be very involved either, and it's going to mean trouble. So Mark, uh, David has a comment and Jack as well. Okay, David. Uh, just, yeah, um, here's my hi two there. bits. Okay. <laughs> I haven't had a chance um, to say hi. Is it, hello, <laughs> that's, that's my fault. I, I just, it slipped my mind entirely tonight. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, actually, I was watching CNN before, so that should really uh, be some input into why Baha'is shouldn't get involved in politics. Um, well, the Baha'i administration is essentially a government uh, that's based on spirituality. You know, Abdul Baha says there's certain quali qualifications or attributes to bring into a spiritual assembly, for example. He said, if you do that, it's light upon light. If they're missing, it's darkness upon darkness. Um, I think an awful lot of politics, uh, in fact, the vast majority of it, is just factionalism based on material self-interest. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and it's so visible. Anybody who is discerning can see how various self-interest parties are trying to manipulate the system to give them what they want you know, favorable laws for companies or rich people getting to reduce their taxes. And uh, Baha'is shouldn't get involved in that because it breaks the fundamental law of unity. Um, and I think Baha'is can't do anything 
in the social realm that doesn't enhance unity. It doesn't bring people together. Like for Baha'is, that's a fundamental law of the faith is, is unity. Um, I can think of a couple of examples where spiritual principles were brought into independence. Well, Gandhi, for example, is one and uh, Martin Luther King and the nonviolent movement in the United States was another. And I think we forget, uh, you know, just how much, you know, the spiritual principles of the African-American church was at the root of the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course it dealt with, uh, it didn't say, it, it was, um, it, it looked at unity, what they were really doing was uh, was more universal than just uh, social justice for African Americans. Um, anyway, that's sort of my my thoughts on it. Uh, I think with Baha'is, if you are to be involved in social issues, uh, you might we might be far more beneficial to look at the system we're dealing with rather than picking a side in a battle. Okay, and Jack, Jack? 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 Okay, Jack. Yeah, well, I, I just want to say that I, I agree with what David has just said and Mark, what you said about politics. Actually, for a very brief time, and this is not a pilgrim's note, this is documented, Abdul Baha did encourage the Baha'is in Iran to get involved for the constitutional reform movement for a brief time. But when that was, which was clearly a political move, but when he saw that it was taken over by the mullahs and so on and got that whole aspect of it involved, he very quickly changed his mind and and told the friends that this was not an avenue that, that they should be pursuing at all. So, and, and of course the Guardian reaffirmed that and uh, you know, for obvious reasons. Now, if you look at the life of Abdul Baha in America, you know that to Bill's point, he, he, he associated with politicians, but he tried to elevate always the conversation If you read his exchanges with a few of them, and some of them were very high up in the American government, he tried to elevate always the conversation with them to to a higher level of of spiritual principle. Now, Mark, I don't know what it is about the Indians, but they have developed, um, I'm sure you'll agree with me on this, and Sri Aurobindo is a good example of this, They know the map of the inner world like no other religion, including, I would say, the Sufis. The Indians have a genius for this, and I don't know how to explain that exactly. But, you know, Sri Aurobindo felt this atmosphere as soon as he landed in India, even though his father had purposely educated him to shun that whole way of life. And, you know, his dad was obviously an Anglophile, if not an Anglomaniac, but, you know, he felt this something tangible uh, as soon as he landed in India, the, the spiritual atmosphere of that, that land. Now, I've never been there. I wanted to go sometimes. My daughter, Leah, said, Dad, you shouldn't go to India. (laughs) But she had her own reasons for saying that. But uh, anyway, there are some strange things that also happen in India. But to look at it in in the positive side, and Sanskrit, the Sanskrit language has something to do with this, and I don't know exactly how to explain it. But I understand that people who know Sanskrit, that have a remarkably developed intelligence. In other words, there's something about Sanskrit that favors intellectual development. And I don't know enough about that to to tell you why, but certainly the one thing that I do not like with 
Indian spirituality is the way that the guru is elevated to the station of the divine. Um, you know, this is not something that we do in our faith, but there is a propensity to, to worship the guru in, in Indian spirituality as an embodiment of, of God, of a living God. And that's, that's the one thing in, um, in, in Indian spirituality that, that I find somewhat exaggerated, if not repulsive. I mean, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't respect. I mean, um, I'm sure all of us will leave your course, Mark, with a much greater respect for people like Sri Aurobindo and so on. But to me, this is you know, the, the devotee, the way that the devotee uh, idolizes his teacher to me is, is some, something that's out of balance, I think. I mean, this is just my, I'm, I mean, I'm speaking obviously here as a Baha'i and, and, you know, the fact that, you know, Baha'u'llah in the act asked for bad, the kissing of hands and so on and so forth, that we're not supposed to be obsequious before other human beings, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, Moshan Khadem told me when, when the hand of the cause, Mr. his father knelt in front of Shoghi Effendi, the guardian was not pleased and he said, you must not do that. The confirmations of God will not reach you. Mm -hmm. So he very clearly did not approve of this. Anyway, I'm, I'm wandering a bit, but I would say that's my one, uh, while there is a definitely, Mark, and I saw you nodding your head, so I guess you agree with me, there's definitely a, a genius in, in, in the Hindu for understanding the stages of the inner life. Um, in my view, the one weakness is the excessive adoration that is given to the to the guru. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I mean, this this isn't you you put your finger right on one of the, the points that the Baha'i faith has to concern itself with. But if you look at Orbindo himself, he was not a disciple of anybody. I mean, he he spent some time with Lili and followed his advice but he didn't have a lot of respect for the guy particularly um, and he dispensed with him as quickly as he could so he was his own being he had his own relationship with his inner guide to me that's the model that Baha'is are going to be probably striving for not to follow other human beings but to contact the divine inside themselves somehow and well, allow using, that to be their guide. Yeah. Well, using Abdul Baha as the perfect example, I guess. Precisely. But I'm leaving it open to, to maybe he has representatives that take care of things for him in different countries. <laughs> you know, who knows who they are? But I mean, I wouldn't be completely surprised to see, you know, Roger White or Doug Martin or somebody coming as an envoy from out of the Baha to help me with something that I'm dealing with. If you see what I'm saying. Mark, this woman who dreamt of him, I didn't understand what her role was exactly. Ah, Mira Alfasa. She's at this point has no real contact with him physically, uh, but she's dreaming of him. Now she's, mm -hmm. she's an interesting character on her own. I mean, I could, easily have done a biography just of her by herself, but you no, know, time is of the essence, unfortunately. <clears throat> but she was highly evolved in her own way. She had the ability to uh, exit a physical reality at the drop of a hat and fly to all kinds of different levels of consciousness. But you're going to be she, talking about her later, aren't you, Mark? Yes, to a large degree, she's going to play a large role in the ashram that develops around Aurobindo uh, in the coming years. But uh, for instance, even at this early period,
period of her life. I don't know whether you've ever had an out of body experience, but apparently the way people describe it is that there's a, a long tenuous cord that goes from your, uh, this, um, it's a luminous thing. It's not physical necessarily, but goes from your physical body off to wherever the spirit is traveling. Uh, she was able to do that very early on. Um, but then she could go to us from that particular point, extrude another body off to some other location and do that in 10 different cases consecutively. So which was is not she, heard of. Was she English? She's dressed like no. a Western woman. Yeah, she's French. Oh, she's she French. In, okay. She grew up in Paris. So I don't, I don't want to get into the psychic abilities that she has, but uh, um, one of them was obviously dreaming, uh, having uh, lucid dreams. And so she was able to contact Orbindo very early on and have uh, develop a relationship before she ever set foot on Indian soil. So we'll meet her next week in more detail. Oh boy, there's so much to say, but <laughs> I want to say it in order so it makes sense to you. But you're right, Jack, about India. There's 5,000 years at least of uh, religious history going on of inner exploration. And so they've got a great deal to show for it. They have an entire vocabulary of all these other realms of God that uh, even Sufism doesn't have. You're quite right. I, I see this as uh, having more to offer us than Sufism. Mm. And the same is true of Buddhism, perhaps even more so. So uh, they're very rich fields to explore. Anyway, that's what we're all about. So you can see why I, I needed extra time to uh, prepare. By the way, Sunisha, who we've seen sort of just the, briefly tonight, for instance, lived in Oroville for a year. And Oroville is a, is a, uh, a utopian city that was created by uh, the followers of Aurobindo just outside of their town. So I'm hoping next week when we talk about it, she'll have something to, to share with us about what it's like to live there. Anyway, had enough? Well, thanks, Mark, for Thank a you. wonderful exposition tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. guys. Yeah, this was fabulous. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Enjoy okay. yourself. Okay. Enjoy all the sunshine and heat. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Mark. This Thank has been you, tremendous. Mark. Yeah, Good great. Night. Bye, okay, everybody. Good night, everybody. Okay. Great to see you all. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. See you, Lisa. Good night, everybody. See ya. Good night. Hi, Peter. Good night. Good night. Oh, Lisa, I hate to say goodbye, but it must be so. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet party. Oh, Lisa. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. How are you doing, Lisa?